Professor Raul Orvieto, will be speaking to us on the matter of does it matter how we stimulate the poor responder with low functional ovarian reserve? Raul. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so I was, I was asked to relate to the question of how does it matter, does it matter how we stimulate the poor responder with low functional ovarian reserve? It's a very hard question to deal with. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. When speaking about poor responders, so poor ovarian response to stimulation actually occur in about 15% of women undergoing IVF. And this figure came from publication during the 1997 2000. I believe that nowadays the prevalence is even higher because we are treating patients with advanced uh, age. And when you are looking at, at the etiology, so you can see that there is viable, many variables that are responsible for a uh, decrease of iron reserve. So what is it, why it is important to actually diagnose patients with uh, poor iron reserve? So it is important because of the prognostic uh, issue. When you are looking at this meta-analysis, looking at pregnancy rate in a <coughs> patient with a poor vine reserve or as compared to a normal responders, you can see that pregnancy rate is significantly lower in a So you can see that pregnancy rate is significantly lower in a patient who has a normal response. Now the next question is how we define poor ovarian response. So until recently, we actually didn't have a one exact definition. And in 2011, the uh, Bologna criteria for uh, the ASHRAE consensus Bologna criteria appeared in the literature. And in order to uh, uh, define responders now we have to patient should fulfill two of these uh, three criteria advanced maternal age previous poor one response less than three all sites with a stimulation with at least 150 units a day and uh, an abnormal ovarian reserve test and since the publication of this uh, definition we actually have a lot of debate dealing with the issue is this definition is fulfilling or not now let's take a look of each of these uh, criteria. So when we are looking at uh, the first criteria, advanced uh, patient age, so it's well known that as the patient age increases, so there is a decrease in life breadth following IVF, which as was already shown before, uh, most of it is related to the increased prevalence of embryonic uh, aneuploidy. When you are looking at the ovarian reserve test, so as you can see here, when you are combining age, AFC, AMH, and FSH, they are a good predictor of patient response and could discriminate between the poor and the high responder. But regarding life birth rate, they actually cannot predict life birth rate, only the ovarian response. What about the number of eggs retrieved? So this is Sunkara studies, and you can see that across all ages, uh, if we are looking only on those patients that yield up to five oocytes, you can see that every additional oocyte significantly increases life birth. So as you can see, the best, the, the more is actually the best. What do we know about a uh, Pregnancy rate according to the number of oocyte yields. So you can see that when you retrieve only one oocyte, so pregnancy rate is significantly low, and it significantly increases with the addition of, of more oocytes. And here you can see again when you combine age and the number of oocytes retrieved, so you better be poor responder and young than poor responder and old, because you can see that younger poor responder yield significantly higher pregnancy rate compared to elderly poor responder. So after this brief introduction, let's see what, which strategies or adjuvant we can offer this poor responder patient. So here is a Cochrane review from two, uh, 2010 uh, that found 15 eligible trials, and then you can see 
actually the conclusion is that there is, no, there is insufficient evidence to support the routine use of any particular intervention or protocol in poor responder patients. And we are looking at this study. The study suffered from inadequate randomized control. We have inadequate randomized control study, suffer from a huge clinical heterogeneity and lack of appropriate uh, outcome data. Uh, this is some of the uh, suggested offered protocol in poor responders. And uh, despite all this information, when uh, Pasquale did this uh, survey, you can see that most of us are still offering the poor responder patient the GNOH antagonist protocol. And when we are choosing the gonadotropin, so we are, most of us use the recombinant FSH combined with HMG. There is, is there any information about the maximal gonadotropin, daily gonadotropin dose that we can use? So here is a study uh, in poor responder undergoing the microflare protocol with three different daily doses of gonadotropin, 300, 450, and 600. And you can see that actually by increasing the dose you can influence the life birth rate. When you're looking at the patient that were included, so you can see that they are not a real poor responders. When we look at our data and we look what happened to patients that did not conceive a with 450 units a day of uh, FSH, and in the subsequent cycle, we increase the dose to 600, we actually can see that by increasing the dose from 450 to 600, we achieve a lower number of, of oocyte and embryo. So it's actually detrimental to the patient and not, there is no any advantage. Another lately published uh, a prospective study in poor responders, again comparing 450 units to 600 in young and old uh, patients. So you can see that actually clinical pregnancy rate did not differ with increasing the daily dose of gonadotropin. So probably 450, 300 to 450 units a day are enough. So if you are giving these huge doses and at the end of the day there is actually no uh, benefit in term of uh, increasing the oocyte yield. So you can say, okay, if she's not responding, so let her recruit the follic her follicle naturally and let's embark on the natural or modified natural cycle. So you can see a study from Brussels. They look retrospectively at poor responder patient according to the Bologna criteria that they underwent the modified natural cycle. And you can see pregnancy rate is actually very, life rate is very, very low using the poor responder across all ages. And it was significantly lower than what could be achieved after stimulating the patient. We again looked at our data. And we looked at patients that we call them genine poor responder, meaning that patients that uh, were stimulated with at least 300 units of FSH a day and despite this high dose of FSH, yield it up to three oocytes. And this pa we looked at this patient, did not conceive on 300 units a day with up to three oocytes, and were offered in the subsequent uh, cycle a modified natural cycle. So you can see the modified natural cycle in, in patients that did not conceive with a stimulation with at least 300 units a day, only 0.9% achieve a live birth with, according to the SRM that you heard this morning, it's actually a futile treatment, the modified natural in, in uh, poor responders. And when we look at those patients that following this 300 unit a day achieved only one all site, so you can tell them no matter what you are giving, you, we are doing, so it's the same. So let's do a natural cycle because with 300 we yield one all sites, let's see what you will do with the natural the cycle. So none of them conceived. So if you're speaking about modified natural cycle, it has no role in, a poor, poor, in poor responder patient. Now let's look at what happened with adjuvant therapy. So we'll start with the androgens, the use of androgens. Here is a meta-analysis from Talazzi's group looking at the use of androgen and androgen modulating agent in poor responder. And in this meta-analysis 2012, they found that actually the addition of testosterone yielded significantly higher life rate in uh, poor responders. 
The same year, another meta-analysis looking at testosterone, and again, a significantly higher uh, life birth weight in patient uh, treated, pre-treated with testosterone. I believe that testosterone would be one of the uh, treatments that we should offer this patient. The problem is that there are three studies, a very small number of patients using this different preparation, different mode of therapy, so we need more study before embarking on this uh, 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 androgen. What about DHEA? So we heard a lot about DHEA during this conference. Meta-analysis from 2015 that included eight studies showed, revealed that there is actually a significant increase in clinical pregnancy weight after the addition of DHEA, but it couldn't show any uh, benefit regarding the oocyte retrieval, implantation, and abortion weight. Another meta-analysis, more studies, 21 studies that were published this year, Again, significantly higher life birth weight, and it, they, they actually could also demonstrate a significantly higher implantation weight, number of oocyte yield, improvement in AMH and AFC level. So DHEA, probably yes. And here you can see the summary of the Cochrane review from 2015, again relating to the andro to androgen pretreatment, and here you can see that both DHEA and testosterone yield a significantly higher life birth weight uh, in poor responder patient. Growth hormone, another hormone that you have heard about it from Dr. Barad. Growth hormone directly stimulates the proliferation differentiation of granulosa cell and has ovarian steroidogenesis, follicular development, and ovarian response to FSH. And it's probably due, it, it, this is probably due to the stimulation of the IG, IGF production. And here the first meta-analysis, so one of them, two, 2009, that, uh, that included six randomized controlled trials. And as you can see, growth, the addition of growth hormone improved significantly clinical pregnancy rate and life birth rate. Now a closer look to this meta- A closer look to this meta-analysis, you can see that they included six studies. One of them actually treated PCOS patient which are not poor responders. The other, in the other, it was not, it was unclear how many patients were uh, withdrew or canceled. And in the third um, uh, study, poor IVF respondents do not benefit. It showed that uh, poor IVF respondents do not benefit from co treatment. So just as I showed you yesterday, just being a randomized controlled study does not justify its inclusion to the meta-analysis. It's always remem remind me the Dr. Langer joke that when he's relating to meta-analysis says that meta-analysis is like a sausage. Only God and the butcher know what within it, but n none of them eat, eat it. So that's meta-analysis. So when you are relating to the studies regarding growth hormone, so huge clinical heterogeneity, different uh, doses, different protocol, different time of administration. <coughs> and uh, in a recently published, uh, uh, again, another meta-analysis, now consists of 11 studies, they could demonstrate that uh, the addition of growth hormone increased uh, the number of oocytes and the number of embryos, but did not influence or improve the right hand and the left hand, a, a clinical pregnancy rate or, a life, or implantation rate. So I think that we should wait to the CHR study that now is giving the growth hormone in a different way, probably more scientifically or biologically uh, correct to give it during the early stage of folliculogenesis. And I hope that it will show improvement in another treatment mode. Another study from Egypt uh, uh, published this, this year, I think, in fertility sterility. No, n last year, again, prospective randomized study, growth hormone versus not a, a without growth hormone, no difference in clinical or ongoing pregnancy rate. So we're speaking about growth hormone probably in the mode and dose that is given today. Not, we should not use it. What about LH supplementation? Again, 
a very large uh, meta-analysis, including studies that uh, treated patients with the long protocol, with the short protocol, with the antagonist protocol. And as you, as you can see, in this meta-analysis, they uh, actually showed that there is a relative increase in clinical pregnancy rate of about 9% in the overall IVF population. <coughs> then when they regard to poor responder, the increase was even higher and was up to 30%. So if you're relating to all or IVF population or the poor respondent treated with various of protocol, probably there is some beneficial effect of LH. Now, if you are concentrating only on those that uh, are treated with the antagonist protocol, which is the preferred protocol that we are using in poor responders, so when you relate to whether the addition of LH has any beneficial effect in this poor responder treated with the, the antagonist protocol, so you can see that uh, actually the addition of LH, you need less FSH, you achieve a higher peak estrogen level, you achieve lower oocyte yield, so FSH alone, you get more oocyte than the combination of FSH and LH. And when they, they had to relate to the to clinical pregnancy rate, so they stated that there is no data till now that can help you to, to decide whether to add or not to add LH. So LH, we don't know. So you can see the summary of all the measures, treatment, strategies that were offered to poor a responder patient. And the conclusion of the uh, Homburg review is that poor response to control of hyperstimulation is still largely, still largely remains an unresolved, poorly understood issue. And you will probably ask me what you are doing in your unit, so I showed it already yesterday. We're actually offering these uh, frustrated cases, the ultra-short antagonist protocol, and we are getting to the trigger, to trigger final follicular maturation, so we are triggering them either with the double trigger or the dual trigger 34 hours prior to a oocyte retrieval. And here I can show you the interim analysis of our prospective studies. It's also regi registered in the NIH website. We, we randomized three group of patient, poor responder patient undergoing a, a trigger with HCG, agonist triggered with full dose of HCG on day of ovum pickup, and the double trigger, and with these small numbers of patients, we can start to see, we are actually st starting to see a trend toward the, an improvement in the, top, in the top quality embryos and even pregnancy rate. Thank you.